introduce Dr. Rambach, who does not need any introduction and has also contributed significantly. I'd like to get his view now on the interventionist perspective on endo versus open. So it's never good to go second in a debate, particularly against uh, somebody with whom I have uh, such great respect. But I think with regard to CLI, I have the upper hand here. As I will show you, these are patients who have uh, significant, substantial comorbidities, uh, very difficult uh, compromised distal targets for bypass, uh, really, uh, you know, very limited other uh, uh, options. And, um, you know, these are challenging uh, patients in any possible uh, regard uh, for whom endovascular intervention certainly will seem favorable. These are my disclosures, and none of these are particularly relevant to this talk. So I start with this question, what would you do? You know, in the end of the day, we all have our strategies, our approaches, and our biases, but you have to kind of vote with your feet, or in our cases, vote with your hands. And this is obviously a patient who has a uh, critical limb ischemia with a hallux uh, ulcer, some uh, femoral popliteal disease, single vessel uh, runoff uh, with uh, tibio perineal trunk disease, reconstituting essentially dorsalis pedis artery and very little flow in the foot. Is this a good patient for surgical uh, bypass? Will you treat this multi-level disease? How will you approach it? And that's sort of be the question here at hand as we move forward. We've already seen that critical limb ischemia is an increasingly prevalent public health problem. This is uh, not something that we should take lightly. This is an increasing part of all of our clinical uh, practices due to diabetes, metabolic syndrome, the aging of our population, and the high occurrence of end-stage renal disease. And as we saw earlier from Michael Jaff, you know, many of these patients get inadequate evaluation and no attempt at revascularization before they undergo amputation, which really has, you know, been considered historically as safer and less invasive, which I never understood how removing a limb is less invasive than threading a four French catheter through an artery. Revascular options certainly need good and, uh, you know, well-publicized outcomes. We need level one data, and we're now working on that to officially change these treatment paradigms, but I think the data I'm going to show you now it may be convincing enough. The problem is that prior trials have been inconclusive. The PREVENT trial, BASIL, Olive Registry, all of these had limitations, but none of these evaluated contemporary endovascular therapies. The whole range of the treatment armamentarium, including not just devices, but strategies, multi-vessel revascularization, pedal access, pedal loop revascularization, which generally not included in these trials, but have really important uh, impact on overall clinical outcomes. So on the surface, you have this option, or you have this option. What would you do? Certainly, uh, endovascular therapy is great in that you don't create a new wound. Recovery is certainly much quicker, and even if you look at the basal trial, a great advantage was quicker recovery, fewer ICU days, and therefore shorter care. No difference in outcomes for patients within two years. That was with old endovascular therapy. You don't need a conduit, which is often not available in surgical patients. You don't need general anesthesia. Uh, the procedures are generally quite a bit uh, quicker, although, of course, it depends upon the complexity of the disease. Certainly, you don't get the operator exposure to fluoroscopy uh, when you uh, do surgical repair. And reintervention still remains the Achilles heel of endovascular, although that's also a flaw of uh, surgical therapy. And the problem is, for simple lesions, there's no real equipoise for surgery versus endovascular uh, therapy. It's only for the complex lesions, and that's the problem with trials, and maybe the problem with the best CLI trial, is whether there'll be equipoise in treatment assignment. That is, for clinical trials, if a patient comes in with a focal tibioperineal trunk stenosis, how many operators in this day and age are going to go ahead and do a bypass? If you look at BASIL, which to date is the uh, large randomized trial with uh, 456 consecutive patients with limb ischemia, you see there were really major problems with this uh, trial, although this is the gospel whereby uh, there is still uh, argument for surgical uh, bypass. Only 15% of the patients were suitable for re, uh, re, re, uh, randomization. Um, you know, the great majority were not unsuitable for the variety of reasons, as you can see on the right, including 20% who just could not have surgery. And maybe, you know, at that time, patients who felt, uh, or physicians who felt they cannot revascularize at all. Only uh, of those randomized uh, patients, 31% refused. So only 11% of patients are randomized. So it's not really a real-world cohort. In the endovascular, there was a 19% technical uh, failure compared to only 3% for open surgery, and that certainly has changed with more experience, new techniques, new tools, and new strategies. 
There was a 28% revascularization rate in the endovascular uh, arm, but, you know, surgery was not too far behind and certainly a challenge for both of us. And only 25% of bypasses really had a, uh, had a prosthetic grasp. So this represents kind of an idealized group of individuals who had good conduit. But if you look at patients who had uh, PTFE grafts, they had you know, much lower amputation-free survival uh, rates than the patients who had veins, and many of these patients don't have uh, veins. And the main reason that patients were not suitable for re-randomization re-random- uh, was the absence of a conduit. Uh, not only that, but this is a trial which compared therapies, but endovascular therapy is preferred in patients who were sicker. You know, but despite that, it was associated, as I said, with fewer IC day, ICU days and lower costs. If you directly compare uh, hemodynamic response after endovascular therapy and surgery in this study of patients with diabetes and critical uh, uh, limb ischemia, you see that certainly there's essentially a no difference uh, in, in post-intervention uh, outcomes over here. You can see the uh, mean change here, and these are the uh, pressures, as you can see, the toe pressures. Both patients, you know, both cohorts did very, very, very well. The uh, rate of major amputation was exactly the same as similar terms of follow-up. Endovascular was not inferior in any way to surgical bypass. And this large propensity analysis of more than a 1,000 patients randomized endovascular or st- evaluated who had endovascular therapy versus surgery, 262 versus 761. You can see here in the middle, rates of revascularization were essentially the same. Subsequent bypass, obviously, in patients who had not had initial bypass, rates of major amputation, essentially the same. Again, actually, no difference if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves in subsequent uh, amputation-free survival for endovascular, predominantly consisting of angioplasty, compared to bypass surgery. When you compare long-term limb salvage and survival, again, comparing these uh, two uh, cohorts in this study with 295 endovascular therapies, 138 uh, open uh, uh, patients, you can see, again, essentially about the same. But the big thing that sort of stands out here is this 30-day mortality, 6% more than double what was seen in endovascular. And again, this is a major problem in these patients who frequently are older and sicker and often have coexistent coronary artery disease because tibial disease is a coronary equivalent. And finally, endovascular therapy compared to surgery has definitely unique advantages. Certainly, when you do bypass, you cannot not address the pedal arch. Here's an example of a patient with calcaneal ulcer. We know how difficult these can be. Single vessel perineal runoff, reconstituting uh, dorsalis pedis. In this case, we came through and we did extensive revascularization around the pedal arch and get this sort of result where we have an excellent uh, perfusion, excellent calcaneal perfusion. This patient healed their calcaneal wound. I would challenge any surgeon to be able to accomplish this result with a bypass where you don't address in detail that outflow. And the other distinct advantage of endovascular therapy is multivessel therapy. Bypasses generally to a single target, uh, with some exception. And here's a uh, patient, again, single vessel perineal runoff, reconstituting that uh, lateral uh, plantar. But, you know, we know that almost all wounds are in ischemic penumbra and have multivessel you know, contribution. It, angiosome is really very limited as you get down uh, into the foot. So in this case, through a uh, combined antegrade and transpedal retrograde approach, as you can see over here, uh, multi-vessel therapy is uh, done. Uh, at the end of the uh, day, this patient has three vessels uh, that are open down to the foot, and they heal their wound. So in conclusion, you know, endovascular therapy provides equivalent clinical results in most cases with less morbidity. Certainly the patients prefer it. They go home the same day and similar limb salvage. It's applicable to a sicker cohort of uh, patients. It may be less expensive. I would argue that revascularization rates down the line are equivalent and improving as we advance endovascular therapy, and that's not even including such things as cell therapy and uh, cytokine-based therapy, which further improve endovascular uh, outcomes. The office therapy for uh, multivessel and pedal arch disease, which is not even possible with surgical uh, bypass, and we're only getting better. And we will obviously see, time will tell, where the best CLI data will provide some of these needed answers. But I suspect that there will be limitations because of the failure of really looking at uh, randomization of similar types of patients within each group. Thank you for your time. Thank you.